Well, welcome to worship here at Starkville First United Methodist Church. We're glad you're with us, whether that is live in person or whether you're watching us on the other side of the screen. We appreciate you taking your time to be with us, but more importantly, we're grateful that you've taken this time to be in the presence of the Lord. We've got several announcements that we want to share this morning as we get a little bit closer to Holy Week. One of the first announcements is our schedule for Holy Week coming up. On Monday, Thursday, we will have a variety of programs here at the church. We will have children's ministry activities with the Upper Room Experience down at the children's end of the CLC. The youth will be upstairs in the youth hall having their ancient feast night. And then we will have adult worship here in the sanctuary. All of that simultaneously, 6 p.m. So you, you come bring your family, and then head on out. There will be a nursery provided, so be aware of that as well. And you'll hear more about that in the days ahead. On Good Friday, we're going to have a couple of special opportunities that involve the community. Our Community Stations of the Cross is on for this year, and we'll start, as traditionally it has been the case, right outside these doors at 9 a.m., headed to St. Joseph Catholic Church. If you'd like to be part of that and have never had that opportunity before, this is your time on Good Friday coming up. And then Good Friday afternoon at 5 p.m., we're going to have a community prayer service for Good Friday. It will be held at Fire Station Park, next to the fire station, conveniently. And that'll be at 5 p.m. You'll probably want to bring a chair and a mask when you go there, but that's uh, Good Friday afternoon. And then on Easter, we have not one, not two, not three, but count them, five different worship opportunities for you on Easter Sunday morning. We've got a sunrise service that will be at 6.30 at Dodson Farms, and we'll give you some more details about that, and it'll be an informal uh, outdoor sunrise service. And then here in the sanctuary, we will have traditional worship at 8, 9, 30, and 11. Give people plenty of opportunity to spread out, but still allow us to be able to accommodate all the number of people that will be here on Easter Sunday. And there will also be a connection service at 11 o'clock as well down the hill. So one of those ought to work for you. We'd love for you to be here on Easter Sunday and bring some of your family and invite some friends with you. We've made as many opportunities as we can so that everybody will have a place on that day. Now, we also want you to know that there is a special event coming up this Thursday for the Mississippi State Wesley Foundation. They're having a barbecue on wheels which means you can drive by and pick it up. It'll be from 4 to 6.30. Uh, is that right, Jonathan, 4 to 6.30? I got a nod. Okay. It's 4.30 to 6. Say, Jonathan doesn't know. Thank you, whoever that was over there. Whatever masked, it was Anna. Anna is the one that reminded me of this announcement that I didn't write down. And uh, she will be outside following this service with free tickets. That sounds a little bit like an oxymoron. The ticket is a placeholder so they know how much food to prepare. Your cost of the meal is a donation. You can be way more generous than the cost of that little barbecue meal will be. So uh, we appreciate your support of our college student ministry on campus here. And then one final announcement. Just remember as we move forward, all the uh, vaccines are dropping into place. All the distancing and capacities are starting to change. We'll start unwinding our activities here slowly. It took us a bunch of months to get here. We're, we're going to draw down starting the Sunday after Easter in various ways. A number of your Sunday school classes will be returning if they haven't already, so be on the lookout for that. And I want to give a special shout-out, a welcome, if you will, to my good friend, Reverend Ricky Haynes, down here in the front like a good pastor ought to be. Ricky is the district superintendent of the Senatobia district. He's the one tapped to take my place when I got to come to God's country here. And so, uh, Ricky, thanks so much for being here with us today. 
is a bulldog at heart and uh, loves, loves all things MSU. So make, make sure you give him a good hail state before he gets out of here. And we want to begin our time of worship this morning as we focus on the Lord, sharing our call to worship responsively as the words appear on the screen from Psalm 111. Let's speak with joy in our hearts and in our voices together. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have good understanding. Will you stand with me as we affirm our faith in the reciting of the, Lord, of the uh, Apostles' Creed? The words will be on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. While you're standing, this is your opportunity to give everybody a big wave and fist bump. Make sure they feel welcome. campers set out on a journey. They stepped out in faith, not knowing exactly what they would find, but embracing the call to go beyond what they already knew. What they found was friendship, faith, laughter, play, prayer, and adventure. This summer, Camp Lake Stevens is excited to welcome both new and returning campers into a new adventure. As we explore together God's call to shine bright with the light of Jesus Christ in all that we do. Because when we step out in faith, who knows what we might find. Good morning, everyone. We can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. That's better. Good job. Well, um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Audrey Jordan, and I'm the children's pastor here at Startful First United Methodist Church. And I'm so happy today to introduce you to Jeff Wilson, hanging out over here. Um, Jeff Wilson is the assistant director at Camp Lake Stevens, we just saw the video about summer camp. And um, I wanted to share a few things about Jeff so y'all can get to know him too. So Jeff and I have known each other for almost 10 years now, I would say. Um, we were counselors together at Camp Lake Stevens. And in fact, Jeff may have been a counselor for some of you or for someone you know. Um, a fun fact about Jeff, he is very knowledgeable about the environmental sciences. You kind of have to be to work at a camp, I think. And when I was an eighth grade science teacher back in the day, Jeff came and was a guest speaker for my classes and he brought all kinds of fossils and rock samples. And so we know that Jeff rocks, okay? Yeah. All right, thank you, thank you. And on a personal note, a few years ago, Jeff became part of my family when he married my sister Emily, who's over here. Um, and so Jeff is Uncle Jeff to Sirius, many of you know and love. Yeah, so um, I've seen Jeff take care of his own campers, take care of creation, and now his job is to take care of every aspect of summer and retreat programming at Camp Lake Stevens. He's someone I know we can trust our children and youth with. And I can't wait for all of you to get to know him and to hear what he has to say about our upcoming summer programs at Camp Lake Stevens. So let's give Jeff a big start. We'll welcome. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey everybody. Hey. Ooh, yeah, there we go. So again, I am Jeff. I um, also, thank you so much for allowing me to be here um, and worship with you guys this Sunday morning. Um, I hear I have some huge shoes to fill with Sirius, so please <laughs> shed a lot of grace on me with this. I'm, I, I don't know if I will reach to his, his aspirations and his heights, so um, cool. So who's ever been to Camp Lake Stevens before? Dropped a kid off, had an experience, anything like that? Yeah, we got some folks. So who has never ever been before? We got a few people, yeah, cool. So Camp Lake Stevens is Methodist camp, um, conveniently for our Starkville people, just outside the Oxford city limits. So 
no worries about Ole Miss there. Um, just outside the Oxford city limits, um, we, we mainly do, we do elementary, junior high and senior high campers, pretty much K through 12. Um, all summer long, we've got tons of events, everything from three day long sessions all the way to three week long sessions. Lots of different things to do. But I want to get back, um, lots of different things. Um, we have a lot of different sessions. There we go. So I want to get back to our friends who have been to camp before. So if I've ever said, or, or if, if anyone's ever said to you, Camp Lake Stevens is awesome, Camp Lake Stevens is, is wonderful, Camp Lake Stevens is holy ground, that kind of means something to you, right? You, you've had an experience there, and you can say, like, yes, I've had that experience. But our people who've never been there before, y'all may be oh, like, okay, everybody says everything's awesome nowadays, right? So, so there's not, it, it's kind of a little bit harder of a connection for you. Um, so we've been thinking over the past year, we've had a little bit of time over the past year to think about some stuff, um, and we've come up with five words um, that we think describes the Camp Lake Stevens culture um, as in, in, in a more deliberate, more intentional way to help, help new people understand what makes Camp Lake Stevens so great. And those five words are connect, cultivate, explore, grow, and renew. And so the way it works is when you come to Camp Lake Stevens, whether you're a camper, an adult, pastor, clergy, lay, whatever it is, um, we, we, our hope is that you come to that place and you, you feel a deep connection to God and you feel a deep connection to the folks around you. And those folks may not just be from Starkville, Mississippi. We've actually got two campers this summer who are going to come all the way from Colorado. So folks from all over the, all over the U.S., you're going to get a connection with them and, and have some really human-to-human -human interactions with them through some shared experiences. Next, through those connections, we hope that you cultivate lifelong bonds with each other and lifelong Christian community with one another. And that's something that's really hard nowadays, right? Um, Camp Lake Stevens is one of those rare places where you get to literally spend 24 hours a day for up to a week or three weeks in total Christian community with another human. So that's really awesome. So through that cultivation, we want, through that cultivation of that community, we explore. We explore creation with each other. We, we explore new activities. Maybe this might be the first time you or your camper gets to learn how to cook over a fire. That, that, that's, a, that's a huge personal growth place, right? You might get to the first time, if you go on an adventure trip, you might get to go whitewater rafting for the first time. That those growth, or those exploration through community aspects um, is, is a big part of what we're doing. And then finally, or sorry, fourth, penultimately, um, through, through that exploration, we hope for growth for everyone, whether it's growth in personal um, skills and attributes, maybe it's just social skills, Maybe it's um, learning a new skill like archery or canoeing, um, but we also um, want huge growth in our faith lives, right? So, so through those shared experiences with one another, through worship twice a day, um, through cabin devotions, through staring at the stars, we, we hope to offer a place for deep growth for our people. And finally, with that grow, growth, we hope that you, really, you leave Camp Lake Stevens renewed um, in, in a renewed sense of of personal self, a renewed sense of what it is you're doing in your life, what, whatever your, your calling is or your vocation is, and finally, a renewed sense to go transform the world. So, so those are the five words that we hope that when you come to Camp Lake Stevens, you experience those five words in whatever way, whether it's one day, one hour, three weeks, a whole summer. Um, but yeah, so thank you. Um, again, if you have any questions, I think I will be down in the CLC after this service if you want to talk more about um, whether it's more about what we're doing to stay COVID safe this summer or just more specifics about different, um, different opportunities we have this summer. I would love to speak with you and learn more about you. Thank you all. Thank you, Jeff. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, it feels good to sit in your presence this morning. To be in the house of the Lord, to be with you, to be celebrating our relationship with you. And while we are here in this special place and we are worshiping together, we know that you are with us throughout the week too. And for all of these things, we praise you and we glorify you. And even though we mentally know it, 
I pray that you would help us to experience you in the depths of our soul. Not just this morning as we are in worship, but throughout the week, in every conversation, in every small thing that we do. I pray that we would experience you so that those around us would experience you too. That's what you've called us to do, to be ambassadors for you, to be people who share the love that we've experienced in you, to be a blessing to others the way you have blessed and poured out your grace and your love and your mercy on us. Do not let us take that for granted. As we worry about finance, as we worry about health struggles, as we worry about everything that we come up against in a, in a given day, remind us that we never go through it alone. That you indeed are with us. God, we are so thankful for you. We ask for those of us who are struggling that you would heal, that you would renew, that you would help us to grow, that you would connect us to you like never before. And I pray your grace and your mercy on us when we fail. Your grace and your mercy upon us when we think we know better than you. When we think we are in charge and have it all figured out. And that we are kings of our own new kingdom. Remind us that it is you alone who are worthy to be praised. Help us to be instruments of your love. Help us to grow. Help us to walk with you like never before. God, I pray for this community and this country and all that it's dealing with, from a coronavirus to an economy to everything that is happening in this world. We know that you have called your church to be instruments of light, to be instruments of love. Help us to know how to do that so that we can bring your kingdom here as we pray together as the saints have always prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I ask you, as we go into our offertory this morning, what is it that keeps us from being a more generous people? You ever thought about that? My hunch is it's fear. We cling to what we know we need or think we need. And what God wants from us is a heart that wants to give. And that heart comes from knowing that God provides no matter what. That's what helps us set aside that fear. So as we do our offertory, as we go through our offertory this morning, as we worship, let that be the meditation of your heart. Ask God, what is it that's holding me back from being an even more generous person? Because we know this, God blessed us so that we may be a blessing to others. The old rugged cross. During this season of Lent, we've been moving toward 
the cross, the culmination of all the events of Holy Week that would then move on to the joy of the resurrection. And as we've taken a look week by week at God's preparation for His people for the coming of the Christ, we've been doing so through the lens of covenant and the biblical understanding of our relationship with God in that covenant. So it's a little time for a review. We talked about initially the covenant of hope that God established initially through Adam and Eve in the garden and then reestablished through his servant Noah. We talked about how Abraham was able in cooperation with God to establish a covenant of faith. And we followed that by looking at a covenant of obedience that God sent through Moses and the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Last week we talked about the covenant of eternity that was established through the line of King David that would continue down through the ages and how that would produce a descendant who would be king over all of God's people. Today we learn about a new covenant a covenant that God will place in our hearts and that will help us maintain our relationship with our Lord. Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning with the 31st verse. Hear the word of God. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, open our minds to these words and open our hearts to the living word of Christ that we may be changed today and forever. Amen. Jeremiah saw that the people of God had not upheld their end of their covenant arrangement with the Lord. Time and time again, they turned their back on God and turned inward toward themselves, with the result that the nation of Israel was destroyed, the kingdom of Judah wiped off the map, the people were carried into exile, and they were in despair that they would ever return. But Jeremiah had a glimpse of a better future, a new day to come, and he tells of a covenant which God will establish in the hearts of his people, a covenant that's made up of four points, which works out conveniently for us this morning. There'll be a new heart, a new relationship, a new knowledge, and a new forgiveness. All of that is fulfilled in Jesus, who offers us a new covenant. The new covenant will begin with this covenant of the heart. Verse 33, I will put my law within them, And I will write it on their hearts. The old covenant was based on this idea of the law that we talked about. The covenant of obedience set forth through Moses at Mount Sinai in the Ten Commandments. Our response to that covenant is simply to accept them. To begin to follow God's will for our lives. And that's all well and good, but eventually... People back then, as people will today, people began to think that they could get by with following the letter of the law and ignoring the spirit, the motivation behind the law. It will be tough in this new covenant to ignore the inspiration or the 
the meaning behind the law because it will be written on our hearts. We'll know it internally, not externally. The will of God will reside where it matters, deep inside our souls. The motivation for obedience is important, as it is in everything else. I was watching a news story here a little while back about a Marine Corps colonel who was briefing his frontline troops, and he was proposing a question to them. He said, what is it that makes a 110-pound woman lift a car off her baby who's trapped underneath? What is it that makes a Marine jump on a grenade to save the lives of his fellow Marines? The colonel answered with one word, love. Love is the motivation to do extraordinary things for others. Jeremiah is talking about that kind of motivation. He's saying that under the new covenant, people will now obey not because of fear or reward, they will obey out of this motivation of love. They will obey out of a motivation for the love of God and our love for one another. God will give them a new heart to carry this out. And then the second part of that covenant is a new relationship. Again, back to verse 33. I will be their God and they shall be my people. We're talking about restored relationships. That's the purpose of the covenant relationship all through Scripture in the first place, is to link us to the God who created us, to put friendship back between God and humanity. Where it started in the Garden of Eden, God is taking us back there to enable us to walk daily with the Lord, to make things right so that women and men can have that relationship with their God. One young man kept telling his girlfriend that he loved her, but she found out he was still seeing other women on the side. Finally, the young lady confronted him and said, how can you say you love me to the bottom of your heart? The young man said, well, I do love you from the bottom of my heart. It's just that other women occupy the top two-thirds of my heart. When it comes to God, it's all in. It's a full relationship of love. There can only be one true love, one true focus for our lives and our souls. It was sin that separated the people of God from the one who created them. In the covenants, we have the opportunity to have that relationship restored. Our sin causes us to take our focus away from God, but it is that covenant that allows us to restore that relation and that focus with God. There will be an intimate, up-close, personal understanding of the Lord once again. Biblical faith always emphasizes that there is this relationship, a personal relationship with the God who made us. A new relationship is what Jeremiah is telling us will be restored as part of this new covenant that's coming. The third provision of the new covenant then is for a new knowledge. Verse 34, no longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. The hope is that God will give this new knowledge to the hearts of all people, that everyone will know God. And it's not merely just a head knowledge. Jeremiah is talking about a heart knowledge where we feel like we know God. It's kind of like kissing. You know the definition of a kiss, to touch with the lips as a mark of affection or greeting. That doesn't do it, does it? Not at all. That in no way describes the feeling of a mother the first time her child kisses her cheek. It certainly in no way encompasses the feeling of a young man and a young woman the first time their lips meet in a kiss to say goodnight. No way. You've got to have first-hand experience 
of the love of God in this new knowledge to really understand the word kiss. That's what Jeremiah is talking about, a faith that goes deeper than head knowledge, but transforms our heart. The new covenant will not be secondhand. It will be us and God. It will be very personal. People will know God because they have experienced God personally in a very real way. It will be firsthand knowledge. It will be new knowledge offered as part of God's new covenant. And then finally, this new covenant offers us an opportunity for new forgiveness. The last phrase of verse 34, I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. One of the most basic needs of all people is to have our sins forgiven. The late psychiatrist, Dr. Carl Menninger, used to say that if he could convince the patients in his psychiatric hospitals that their sins were forgiven, 75% of them could walk out the door that day. There are two parts to God's forgiveness. First, there is the forgiveness itself. We seem to understand that. We get a hand on that. That's the whole message that we're looking at as we move toward Holy Week. This idea of the removal of the stain of sin on our souls, on our souls removing and cleansing it from our lives it's like punching the clear button on the calculator. It makes it all go away. We get that. It's probably the second part of this forgiveness that we have a more difficult time with, and that is the letting go part. Now, we struggle some with letting go of the sin that others committed to us, but I really think the hardest thing that we have in front of us is letting go of the sin we have committed toward others and most certainly the sin we have committed in the eyes of the Lord. That's really hard for us to let go of. We say we give it back to God, but then we we take it back. And that weight of that guilt just continues to weigh us down. That's why it's important that we understand that God's forgiveness not only erases the sin from our slate, if you will, but God chooses to remember our sin no more. God holds no grudges. What's past is past. God takes care of our sin, throws it in the deepest part of the sea, and then he goes to the beach and posts a no fishing sign. Don't drag it back out, God said. Leave it there. God's forgiveness is forever. That's part of that new forgiveness that he offers in this covenant arrangement. A new heart, a new relationship, We have the opportunity for new knowledge and new forgiveness. And those are great promises. We hear them from Isaiah, but we also finalize that in Jeremiah. Here's the issue. Jeremiah himself was looking toward a day. This was an aspirational promise yet to be fulfilled 600 years before the arrival of Christ. We, on the other hand, live on the A.D. side of the arrival of Jesus. Christ has come. We have heard the gospel, the good news, that lifts us out of this hopeless state of sin and despair. The promise of hope has been fulfilled. All the things Jeremiah was talking about have come to pass, and Christ has brought that new covenant into existence. Throughout the New Testament, we are told time and again that Christ is the one that Jeremiah had been looking toward who offers this new covenant. For example, one of the best known references to this is in Hebrews, the eighth chapter. The writer to the Hebrews quotes this passage from Jeremiah 31 that we're talking about and then makes an application to Jesus with this. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood, for he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God, based on better promises. In a little over a week, we're going to be selling, uh, celebrating Holy Communion on Maundy Thursday. Perhaps the most significant connection 
between us and God made available through Jesus Christ. That is the new covenant that Jesus offered right before he was crucified. While sharing the Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room, he took the cup and after giving thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember those words and remember these words from the prayer of great thanksgiving that are part of it. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection. You gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. The blood of Jesus is what seals that covenant, the forgiveness of our sin. That is the sign of the new covenant that Jeremiah was proclaiming. A new heart, which results in obedience and love. A new relationship where we are walking with God hand in hand as friends. A new knowledge where we experience God firsthand, personally. And a new forgiveness where our sins are remembered no more. Those are the gifts of the new covenant which Jeremiah foretold. They're here, they're available today through Jesus Christ. Accept that new covenant relationship and God will bless you not only during this holy season, but forever and evermore. May you be blessed in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Gracious God, you are the giver of all good gifts. And this time of year, we especially celebrate the great gift you have given us for healing and wholeness, for an end to sin and a new life that exists in you through your Son, Jesus Christ. We claim that promise as Lent begins to draw to a close and we move into a new life. God, help us to remember the sacrifice that was made to offer us joy, the life that was taken so that we could have life abundantly. God, we put ourselves in your care knowing that you love us, and as we love you, you will honor that covenant through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remind you that uh, those of you that are just coming back for the first time, the ushers will be escorting you out. They'll start at the back and work toward the front. Just think wedding, uh, wedding attendants. The ushers will take you out. Again, from where Charlie and I are sitting right now, it is so good to see so many of you all here. I want to encourage you to continue your journey back and look toward Holy Week and Easter in particular. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for those of you at home for continuing to join us in worship online or by TV. Now, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus now and evermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.